Well, I'd like to thank the library for having me back once again, and uh, especially um, uh, Annie uh, in the back there and Belinda, who was at the door. Uh, really appreciate uh, the, the welcome here, as always, a place I've been coming to since um, almost 20 years now, since uh, 2006. And it's, uh, it's, it's, for me, the Linen Hall is it's really like the the Athens of, of the province. It's a, it's a central central node to the intellectual and cultural life of Northern Ireland, and uh, we're, we're all really lucky to have it. My talk today is about how interwar modernity is manifest through continental camera women, women who dress differently, who travel independently, who plunge into streets and valleys and scale mountains and follow soldiers in battle, are clad in trousers and are armed only with a camera. My subject choices are three daughters of the new century. They were long obscured, um, but now they're resurrected and increasingly discussed and exhibited. They are Dora Maar, born in 1907, Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach, born in 1908, and Gerda Taro, born in 1910. These three women helped forge a new métier, the photojournalist. All three of these women are closely linked with the ideological struggles of the day to wit anti-fascism, but they are also emblematic of modernity and are unique products of a moment in time. Uh, perhaps we should begin first, first with uh, modernity, a definition of modernity, and then explore their biographies, their achievements and pictures. And I'm going to finish the talk today by discussing how their legacies are being kept alive. Well, first of all, what do I mean when I say modernity? Now, I offer a whole lecture on this to my second level students. Modernity, for me at least, is the coming together in the two decades after World War I of technological, social, aesthetic, and cultural changes. It's a term coined earlier by Baudelaire and um, Baudelaire referred, when he talked about um, modernité, he referred to the ephemeral buzz of excitement one feels standing on a street corner in an ever-changing, bustling city center. Stand on a street corner and what you observe will never be precisely repeated. It is an undulating creature, an, organ, an organism populated with people and machines Modernity is that which is fast and shiny and metallic and electronic. Modernity is mass produced newspapers and new poster art. Modernity is the subway car transporting urban workers underground while airplanes fly overhead and movies projected in a darkened hall. Uh, the, the, the movies are the, the, the art form of modernity par excellence. Movies, why are they called movies? Because they move. And they're also called the cinema, which is based on the Greek word, and Annie will correct, correct me, kineo, uh, which, which informs our, our word kinetic. They are that which uh, is in motion. And into that mix you add new clothes styles and hairstyles, especially for women, personified in France by the figure of La Garçon. Uh, and my colleague uh, Dominique from French in, in, at, at Queens knows, knows all about La Garçon, Modernité, and Baudelaire. For me, nothing better brings together all the components of modernity than the 1930s camera woman, the female photojournalist, fleet-footed, agile, dressed in clothing that permits rapid movement, polyglot, infected with wanderlust, never satisfied with staying put, always in motion, 
and the faster, the better. They hike, walk, run, ski, hop on bicycles, motorcycles, they fly in airplanes, cars, they take trains and boats. Dora Maar, Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach, and Gerda Tauer were all most at home plunged into streets on their own, alone with a camera, but they all thrived as well on speed. And now for the next question, who were they? Well, <clears throat> before we get there, let me just say that part of the META emerged due to technological advances in the late 1920s that permitted finally fast photography to be born. Before the late 1920s, well, before about 1925 through 1933 or 34, photography was a bulky, slow affair. Insofar, for example, as there was such a thing as war photography or battle photography, it was, it was of dead soldiers. I mean, look at the World War I or the uh, American Civil War photography. And photographers love to go to the battle, battlefields afterwards because the, the subjects didn't move. And only with the new uh, picture, uh, cameras like the Leica 3 or the Roliflex 621, which, which Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach preferred, which you hold at your waist, as opposed to the Leica, which you hold here. Um, only with these cameras were you able to capture motion. They're the, they're the quintessential cameras for the phenomenon of modernity sports photography, wildlife photography, uh, war photography, for example, like Gerda Taro uh, practices, as we'll see. So this, this equipment is, is essential. Let me begin first with a key figure in early uh, 1930s uh, street and commercial and, and surrealist um, uh, photography, uh, Dora Maar, a name that may be familiar to you because she was also for about 10 years, Picasso's muse and lover. Uh, she was polyglot, like all of my subjects. Um, she was the only partner of Picasso's who spoke Spanish, uh, but also uh, French and Croatian. Her father was a Croatian architect, her mother French, but she grew up in Argentina. Um, her name is a nom de guerre, nom de plume, a derivation of, of, uh, of Henriette Theodora, Markovich, uh, uh, Theodora becomes Dora, Markovich, uh, Mar. Um, Paris in the interwar period was a land teeming with uh, Jewish and other Eastern Euro European immigrants, and there was a great deal of discrimination against them. So many Jews and East European Slavs arriving in Paris would change their names to make them sound a bit less Slavic or Jewish. This is also true for other subjects I'll be discussing today, like, like Gerda Tara, for example, or Robert Kappa. Dora Maar is significant for her avant-garde and anti-fascist activities in the 1930s, and her photography, which ran the gamut from advertising, fashion, surrealist, and the, the street photography that I'd like to talk about now. Um, this is the portrait of Dora Maar that you've saw on the flyer. This is Man Ray's uh, portrait, I think from 1934. Um, this is one of the uh, pictures that Picasso did entitled The Weeping Woman. She's uh, most famously the, the, the Weeping Woman. And here she is with Picasso on the Cote d'Azur. I think that would have been the um, summer of 1937. Now, they were very happy then. <clears throat> when she was in her early 20s, so about age 22 um, or age 23, Dora Maar embarked on a series of solo voyages with a small camera. Um, she uh, began a series of, of candid street photography whose um, focus was the effects on ordinary people of the economic slump. Her pictures chronicled the rising number of beggars who could be seen around rail stations or, or markets. And in fact, in the old market in Barcelona, she, um, she photographed vendors and hawkers of sundry goods. Uh, she took pictures of children. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures here. 
It's called Garçon aux Chaussures des, des, des Paris, uh, a boy with, um, with shoes that don't match. Uh, um, uh, 1935, this was on one of her returns to uh, uh, Spain. Here she's in London photographing um, uh, uh, one-legged buskers, one-legged veterans uh, singing. Her, um, she bears witness wherever she goes to rising homelessness, poverty, uh, food insecurity among the vulnerable. Um, photo photographic projects of this kind were extremely rare for young women at that time. Uh, for a well-off resident of, of Paris, uh, I can't stress to you how unusual it was for a, uh, a woman brought up in comfortable environs to leave home on her own, to roam with a, ca a camera ac across insalubrious quarters in foreign cities. It is a rebellion simultaneously against her own privilege, but also a political act of solidarity. Spain was Dora Maar's first solo adventure, but our other two subjects today, uh, uh, Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach and, and Gerda Taro, would also be drawn to Spain and the Iberian Peninsula. It's no coincidence, for Spain in the 1930s is the land of progressive promise, especially for women, par excellence. The lone European state in the early 1930s moving towards social justice and away from authoritarianism, either of the left or the right. Back in Paris, Dora Maar opens a studio, begins taking publicity pictures for magazines. The picture press was exploding in Europe at this time, and all of our subjects today made a career out of combining or inserting pictures into the press along with, along with articles. <clears throat> but Dora Maar is soon entwined with the surrealists and also the militant anti-left. Her surrealist visions uh, which are photographic, by the way, uh, move into uncharted territory and today are clearly her most identifiable works. The um, untitled, for example, Shell Hand appeared in 1934. Now, for me, this picture is a reference to World War I and the, 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 the terrible um, uh, effects of World War I on the bodies of young men. It reminds me a little of the 1920 picture by Otto Dix called Praga Strasse, if you know what I'm uh, referring to, with the um, uh, uh, with all the fake artificial limbs, right? We can imagine in the wake of World War One a shell washing up on the beach with a human hand in it, can't we? Uh, the picture here on the left is a uh, classic uh, surrealist uh, vision. It's called 26 Rue d'Astorg. It, it is basically a study in the erotic and the uncanny. And finally, this picture here called Portrait of Ubu, and Dora Maar never revealed her source material for this. We think it might have been a, a armadillo fetus or something awful like that. But it's, for me at least, it's an allegorical reference to the ideological conflict of the 1930s. It's produced in the critical year of 1936, so the year the Spanish Civil War begins. And we under, I understand this as a kind of allegorical Kafkaesque reflection on the violent sociocultural transformation sweeping across the continent. Then came <clears throat> Picasso, around the same time. She meets Picasso in 1935, becomes his muse and lover, but the, the story is much more interesting than that because the following year, the Spanish Civil War begins, and in 1937, Dora Maar pushes Picasso, who had given up painting, by the way, at that time. He was just practicing poetry then, and she encouraged him to create a painted response to the Spanish Civil War, and she found him a studio on the, on the Rue des Grands Augustins, the Paris Cinquième, and she organized the whole thing, and not only that, but when Picasso began painting Guernica, of course, the most famous canvas of the 20th century, Dora Maar 
took pictures of the entire process. She chronicled the creation of Guernica. She created a visual diary of Picasso painting Guernica. It was the first time that a great master had been recorded in the process of creation. Uh, and she, uh, Dora Maar, uh, the muse, the subject of The Weeping Woman, she turned Picasso into her muse, didn't she? He is the subject of her work here. Well, after their rupture in 1943, um, Dora Maar withdraws completely. Picasso gifts her as a kind of parting gift, a cadeau de rupture, uh, a house in, the, in Provence, and she uh, stays there for the rest of her life. She gives very few interviews. She doesn't go out. She never, she never marries. She never has another lover after Picasso. She said, well, after Picasso, you got to be kidding. Um, and uh, she, she withdraws completely. Uh, she lived on for it uh, until the end of the, uh, until the end of the 1990s. And, and before her, before she died, a few re researchers took interest in her work suddenly, and they were astonished to find that she was still alive. She would pick up the phone in her flat, and there was the famous sing-song voice of, of Dora Maar. And if you listen to the recordings of her, which you can find, there are only a few, it's like a bird of paradise. But she had no interest in showing her work. Um, she eventually sold some photographs that she had stashed under her bed. And this is how a great trove uh, wound up in the Centre Pompidou, uh, where they were finally shown just a few years ago. The first real show of her work, 100, 110 years after she was born. But we have to move on to Anne-Marie uh, Schwarzenbach, um, a Swiss-German uh, born in Zurich in 1908. And um, I, Schwarzenbach is one of the subjects that I use when I teach uh, undergraduates. And I often show um, these pictures, especially these two pictures here. And I have to tell you that I, I use a lot of real people in my teaching. It's become a big focus for how I teach European history through the uh, works and lives and biographies of real people. And there's no one who fascinates my students quite like Andrei Schwarzenbach. And in fact, all I have to do is show them this picture and they're completely hooked. They fall under her spell and they want to know more. They want to know who, who is this what am I even looking at here? There was no one on the scene in interwar Europe who, who even remotely uh, resembled her or who uh, approached her uh, achievements. Uh, she, um, well, what can I say about her? She, she, she was from an enormously wealthy family, uh, one of the leading industrial families of Switzerland um, uh, at the time, uh, and in fact, all the way up until the 1970s. Her, her great-grandfather was Bismarck, and um, on her mother's side, she was the granddaughter of a famous Prussian general. Her parents are, are, are old school Prussian enthusiasts. And when Hitler comes to power, they are uh, enthusiastic Nazi supporters. In this wealthy family, uh, Anne-Marie will become the dissident. So she's the person who eschews not only the wealth, but the politics and the ideology. Um, she's a... Uh, as a child, she's a kind of special case in that um, she's considered fragile and she's not sent to school until the age of 15, which is kind of remarkable when you think about it, though I find that it may explain some of her originality and creativity because nothing kills off one's ambition and imagination like being sent to school. I mean, name any great creative genius in history, and I assure you, they never went to school. Mozart didn't even have a music teacher, for example. So she certainly benefited from having 15 years on her own at this incredible estate, uh, you know, with a model zoo and all, all kinds of the latest innovations, technological innovations were at her disposal on, on this um, uh, wonderful property that she, she was born to at, uh, south of, of Zurich on the lake. Um, she, despite beginning school late, she proves a quick study. And by the age of 22, she's published a novel and she has a PhD and she's learned languages and she's ready to see the world. But of course, her coming of age is coinciding with the rise of Nazism. 
And she's aware that currents in Zurich and especially among the circle of her friend, of her parents, uh, all support uh, the, the coming of, of Hitler. And this leads her to become a, a dissident and to support the uh, German exiles who take residence in Zurich immediately after Hitler comes to power. So by, by March of 1933, for example, the children of uh, Thomas Mann are living in Zurich in exile and vocally speaking out against uh, Nazism as German refugees, and they're supported financially by Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach. And with the children of Thomas Mann, with Erika and Klaus Mann, Amory shares a love of the arts, of the theater, of writing, and I'm sorry to say also of drugs. And these children, these young people, become addicted to morphine. Uh, Klaus and Erika can just about handle it, but not Amory. And uh, through the balance of her life and her career, which is incredibly prolific, she writes over 300, publishes over 300 articles in the picture press in Switzerland. She takes over 5,000 pictures on her travels. Nonetheless, she's a hopeless morphine addict, uh, addict and is in and out of rehab the whole time. Um, she is also a lesbian, and um, she is given to violent uh, fits of jealousy and rage. Some sometimes being arrested or institutionalized when she uh, aggresses or attacks um, uh, women who she wants to possess. This is her with her camera, the Rolleiflex. And she becomes a photographer as a result of a trip to Spain. Uh, her first trip is to Spain in 1930, I think 1934. I have a list here of her journeys, 1933. And she travels there with the German photographer Marian Breslauer. And the idea is that Anne Marie will take, will write articles, and they will be supported by Mary, uh, Marianne's pictures. But when they get back to Germany, Hitler has outlawed uh, any uh, publication of pictures by Jews. And Marianne Breslauer is Jewish. And, and uh, Anne Marie Schwarzenbach ends up becoming her own pho photographer, photographer, and taking pictures that support her own. Articles. Now, I've, I've, I've typed up here a list of her journeys just to show you how astonishing her travels were in the next 10 years. She sees uh, much of the Orient, Europe, Africa, and makes three separate trips to the United States. And it's these trips that are the basis for her oeuvre, which is combines articles and, and pictures. She uh, is in Spain. Her first trip is in Spain. As I said, it's a kind of magnet for progressive women, especially. Spain is a land par excellence of women's emancipation from 1931. And she takes pictures of soldiers, children, of men playing ball. She is often travels by the in the green convertible Ford that she's gifted by her father. Um, and her companions, who invariably are women, often photograph her in this car, which she has, a, she has a kind of fetishistic attachment to. Later, she'll travel across the United States in a car, driving by night, arriving in villages to take pictures and interview people in the morning. She travels from Geneva to Kabul in 1939. She travels across all of, of Europe and the Middle East, going through Syria and Iran, Iraq, to Afghanistan with uh, the Swiss uh, uh, travel writer A.M. Mayark in 1939, in one of the great voyages of the first half of the 20th century. And what's really remarkable about that trip is actually both of them wrote books about it. You can read these books. A.M. Mayark's book was written in English. And um, both of them uh, stress in this trip on the eve of the war, even crossing places where the skirmishes of war had begun, and traveling through the most patriarchal countries in the world. For this couple, very much a lesbian couple, they encountered no problems at all, and they each say how easy it was. Easy from the point of view on the one hand, that they were welcomed everywhere, and the patriarchal society 
really looked at them with curiosity, but also affection. And also how independent they were, because if you look at these cars, Anne-Marie with her Ford, which was obviously gifted by her wealthy father, but, but believe me when I tell you that wherever she went in her, in her car, in her Ford, whatever, whatever repairs that car needed while she was on the road, Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach was perfectly capable in carrying those out herself. She could fix her own car. She, um, 1937, 1938, she's in the, she takes two trips that she juxtaposes in her works. In her, she travels to, on the one hand, Austria, where she uh, documents the enthusiasm of the Hitler youth for the new regime. And then she travels to Roosevelt's USA, where she documents comparable racism, but greater poverty. She's the only person I know of in the 1930s who is deliberately juxtaposing Roosevelt's America and Roosevelt and the racism of Roosevelt's America with the racism of Hitler's Germany. And she does this very explicitly. The only other person who did this at all did it in the 1920s, and that was Hitler. And Mein Kampf is full of references to the United States. But in Hitler's case, Hitler admires the sharecropping Jim Crow South. He admires the racism. He held, holds that up as a model that Germany can adopt when it expands into the East. But Amory Schwarzenbach is on a, on a different kind of quest, and she's looking for the, uh, the positive results of the New Deal and how this is mitigating the entrenched racism of the post-Civil War South. So, um, the pictures from Alabama are really astonishing, the, the, and the writings as well, well worth exploring. The book to get on this subject is called Far From New York, Far From New York, where she um, published in, in German and then translated into French and English. But she, she, uh, it's, it's some of the best writing I've seen on the racism of the South, always from the perspective of a German speaker from Europe. And there is, um, there's actually AMIR, photographed by Amory Schwarzenbach en route to Afghanistan. AMIR's book is called The Cruel Way, The Cruel Way. Right, so um, I, I, I know that time is working against me. I think it is. <laughs> it is? <laughs> so I want to move on to my next Topic. Although I might say that, uh, so she takes several, she takes a series of voyages and she has this remarkable career that has collapsed in just nine years. Uh, Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach had much more to say, no doubt, um, but she died instead in a, in a careless bicycle accident uh, in, near Sills in, in Switzerland in 1942. Our last subject today is Gerda Taro, born in 1910 born as Goethe Horahil. <clears throat> Her parents were Galician Jews who had emigrated to Germany. They traded in eggs. And the family was well established in Stuttgart uh, in the 1920s. But Hitler's coming to power quickly politicized Goethe and led her, like so many other East European or Jewish exiles, to settle in Paris. They went to Paris because Paris, on the one hand, was not so far away that they couldn't imagine coming back home if Nazism just blew over. So London, which in any case wasn't very welcoming in the first place, the United States was really a bridge too far. So Paris became the the, the, the magnet for these exiles. Schwarzenbach is there too, by the way, studying for a year. Dora Maar is living there. Gerda Taro is there after 1933. Um, for Gerda Taro, her life is much different from my two other subjects for the simple reason that she's Jewish. And for Gerda Taro, her career will be existential 
Gerda Taro becomes a photographer to put food on the table, but also to have a way of participating in anti-fascism. So she becomes an, a propagandist through her pictures. Although, like the like the uh, other two women I'm discussing, she also had and could have continued to have a career in front of the camera as a model. I mean, all of these women are notoriously beautiful and photogenic. Um, Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach was referred to as, as comparable to the angel Gabrielle, uh, even if Thomas Mann called her the devastated angel, but certainly some variation on an angel. And, and Gerda Taro, when you first see pictures of Gerda Taro, you can't imagine this beautiful, petite, blonde, Jewish woman in her early 20s billeting with soldiers in uniform following the infantry. But I think for her, like my other two subjects, beauty was a real tyranny. And to escape that, you move to the other side of the camera. You take pictures instead. And there's no better way to escape the tyranny of beauty than to be embedded with an army. This is what Lee Miller did in World War II. It's what Marlena Dietrich did. Lee Miller, essentially, who was called one of the five most beautiful women in the world, she covered herself in the filth and human ashes from Bergen-Belsen. This was her response to her beauty. And Gerda Taro does something similar. She becomes a photographer, and she does that in part through her meeting with Robert Kappa, who you see here. In Paris in 1935, Kappa is a Hungarian emigre, also Jewish, who had arrived in Paris at about the same time, had also changed his name, like so many of the emigrants did, from a Jewish-sounding name to Robert Kappa, which sounds like a, um, an American actor, doesn't it? Sounds a little like uh, Robert Taylor. Or, uh, and Gerda Taro reminds us of who? Well, Greta Garbo. Uh, so there's certainly a reference here to the cinema. Uh, and, uh, and this picture here, well, of course, we like to look at this and think, ah, oh, you, you sure can tell when people are in love. But if you look at the whole, if you look at the pictures that were taken before and after this one, and we have the whole school, you, you will see that they were fighting that whole day. They were quite miserable, actually. Because Robert Kappa had proposed to Gerda Taro, and she wasn't interested in getting married. She refused his proposal. Uh, Robert Kappa was far more uh, socially conservative than Gerda, Gerda Taro was. She, she had no interest in being tied down, being married. Um, same with Dora Maar. The only, uh, the only woman of the three who met, was married was actually Henry Schwarzenbach, paradoxically. She married a gay man, a French... Uh, uh, a diplomat uh, called uh, Claude uh, Clairac. It was, you might think it was a marriage of convenience. And of course it was, but uh, there was a great deal of affection there. And if you see the interviews of Claude Clairac, uh, Clairac at the end of his life, you can see that they were, they were obviously in love. What I'm saying is people are not black and white. She married, she married. Um, Gerda Taro didn't. Kappa teaches Gerda Taro how to take pictures. And when the Spanish Civil War begins the following year, they travel to Spain. Now, there's a kind of myth. There's a myth that they crash landed in Spain in an airplane. I don't think it's true, though I recently heard a radio drama about Gerda Taro and their, the, their arriving in Spain crash landing. I, I think it's apocryphal, but it does refer back to transportation modernity and how central the uh, airplanes are to all of this. They go to Spain in um, August of 1936. Kappa goes back and forth to Paris. Gerda Taro is pretty much there the whole time. Gerda Taro is taking pictures in Spain for 11 months. She is with the Loyalist infantry. And well, I don't have to tell you, just take a look at this picture. This is Gerda Taro. She's literally running behind the infantry towards the front into battle. Here she is where there's some kind of explosion that's just taken place or a shell has landed. And um, of course, when you're a 
uh, battle photographer, the, the probabilities may eventually catch up with you. She is all over the uh, Republican uh, theater. Um, and uh, we, we know quite a bit about her pictures today. They were obscured for many years, but in 2007, a trove of pictures was discovered in Mexico City, and about 700 of those were Gerda Taro's. A lot of research has been done. She takes pictures of soldiers training at rest, going to sleep, resting. Um, she, uh, I like this picture of the uh, motorcycle loyalist uh, with glinting in the sunlight and looking up, no doubt, looking at Soviet aviation because the Soviets were the only ones who came to the aid of the Spanish Republic. And here she is, a kind of apocryphal or rather a, a, a ominous picture for me because um, uh, this picture of a, of a, of a loyalist tank, uh, uh, she would end up uh, being killed by a loyalist tank in an accident. She takes pictures of La Passionaria, a very important series that she captures. I wrote an article about it when the Mexican suitcase book was published. And she establishes through these pictures of Pasionaria that Pasionaria was a great intellectual, uh, maybe on the par with kind of like a Lenin or a Stalin, the thinker, the revolutionary thinker, not just the propagandist. Here's Pasionaria again. And then these pictures, which are so iconic, and are becoming better known. These are the pictures uh, Gerda Taro took at the beach in Barcelona of the Milicianas training in 1936. Early in the war, the Spanish Republic mobilized women in the, in the, in the war effort, something that was greeted with derision by the British and the Germans and much of the world. The British called them Amazons, you know, tribe of women who live on the edge of civilization. Uh, but these pictures, these pictures are in public domain, right? You could use these pictures to do whatever you want. The, one of the remarkable things about both Gerda Taro and Schwarzenbach is because they died so young, all of their works are in public domain. I thought I'd mention it. This picture especially, it should be one of the two or three great pictures of warfare from the 20th century, but it isn't. This picture was taken in the summer of 1937. It's not at all what it looks like. This is Robert Kappa photographing Greta Taro. She's, she's resting on a little path marker. We might think it's a widow at the grave of her lover, but it's not. But it's, it's a, 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 fo a ominous foretelling because just a few weeks later, Kappa's back in Paris. Gerda with the uh, infantry with the mechanized infantry insisting on uh, photographing the tanks as they move into position, riding on the side of a car. She had been told several times to hang back. She insisted, and a Russian tank uh, uh, careered out of control and, uh, and collides with her, and she dies the next day. The Paris paper, where much of her work was published, had this headline. Notre reporter photographe Mademoiselle Taro a été tué près de Brunette, où elle avait assisté à la bataille. She's brought back to Paris and given a, a hero's burial at Père Lachette. <clears throat> well, what can we say about the legacy, the memory of these three noted interwar photographers. Let me just say first something about Dora Maar, because I mentioned earlier that Dora Maar was gifted this house in the Louvre home by Picasso. That house today, where she lived until the end of her life, is a, is a research center. And you could, even, you could even apply and receive a, a two or three week um, uh, stay there. You could stay in Gerda Taro's house and do some kind of creative project. So I would encourage all of you to uh, consider that, especially the few students I have here. Um, it would be a wonderful experience. There are performances, and you can stay in uh, Gerda Taro's house. Um, this is this little address book here was found by accident in in uh, it was received in a in an, uh, a, a French uh, uh, diary that uh, 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 that was ordered by on eBay a few years ago, and on reception. 
the, um, the woman looked through it and she saw all these references to people like uh, Picasso and, and um, Les Filles Clouseau and, and Georges Bataille and a hairdresser in Menab. And after looking at this for, well, maybe 15 minutes, she realized I'm holding in my hands the, the address book of, of Dora Maar. This was about 10 years ago. And she wrote a book about it called Je suis le carnet de Dora Maar, which has been uh, translated and called Finding Dora Maar, an artist and a dress book and a life. But for the most uh, um, fascinating recent biography, you really have to be able to read uh, Victoria uh, Combalia's uh, Dora Maar, La Femme Invisible, Dora Maar, The Invisible Woman. But not so much invisible anymore. Uh, you can visit the bust that Picasso made of her uh, uh, in, in Paris, uh, which is uh, curious because it, it says on it to Guillaume Apollinaire, and there's no reference to Dora Maar, but this is Dora Maar, I assure you, uh, 1941. Or you can visit her tomb, uh, which is located near um, uh, Paris. But most curious to me is uh, if you go to her house at, at Menard, you see her moped, uh, which is uh, mounted there for all to see. For the last 50 years of her life, though she withdrew from society, refused interviews, never exhibited her work, Dora Maar continued to be an artist. And she moved around Provence in this little moped going up and down these high hills, even as a woman in her 80s, imagine this old woman on a moped. Um, again, for me, it's a kind of uh, vision of modernity. Um, Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach is buried at uh, uh, near Zurich, um, forever 34 years old. Um, uh, Gerda Taro, alone among the three, there's a kind of uh, a pilgrimage, a cult site at her grave. She. Uh, Wherever, whenever I go to Paris, it's usually the first place I visit at Père Lachaise. She's buried near the other communists, uh, um, near the, the wall where the communards were shot, if you know that spot. And everyone there takes a little stone from home and they put the stone on the grave as is the Jewish custom. And here you see, well, just as I said, um, <clears throat> the Gerda Taro has become a kind of cottage industry lately. Lots of books about her recently. And I also wanted to mention a great deal of archival pres preservation taking place uh, just in the last few years, reorganization of all the works of Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach, the, the, all of her 5,000 pictures. The, the, the written legacy is a bit more problematic because when Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach died, her mother and her grandmother immediately burned all of her personal papers, her diaries, and also all, all the letters she, she received. Um, her legacy, her life was obscured, not by male partners, something that we might say about Gerda Taro, but Amory Schwarzenbach was her family that destroyed her papers, uh, which included by, the, it makes me very angry to think about this because uh, Amory Schwarzenbach corresponded with all of the leading cultural lights of the, of the era. In her collection were, were many letters from Carson McCullers, with whom she had a torrid affair, and from Thomas Mann, the Nobel Prize winner, and maybe from Dora Maar or Marlena Dietrich, but we'll never know. And um, Gerda Taro, of course, the Mexican suitcase. So we have uh, uh, 700 pictures by Dora, uh, Gerda Taro, and I, I ordered a copy of that. You can see them in the Queen's Library. There's the Mexican suitcase, and this is the book that came out with all those pictures reproduced. Henry Schwarzenbach is the subject of recent translation into uh, um, English in, in, a, in a series called The Swiss List, including All the Roads Are Open, which is her book about the trip in 1939 to Afghanistan with A. in my art. I just want to say, finally, the other legacy is that um, they, uh, they weren't the last women to be photojournalists. And I would refer you to Lindsay Adario, who's one of the great photographers of our time, born in 1973, who's covered humanitarian crises across Africa and Europe and was in Ukraine for the New York Times for many months and in Iraq and Afghanistan. And where, whenever she's interviewed, she refers to 
Gerda Taro, Lee Miller, and the women of the 1930s who forged this metier. Thank you. I think that we're going to have, if there's time, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. We know about your mic. <laughs> I think this is off now, though. Thank you. Right. Okay, great. Anybody ready? Oh, never mind. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the, uh, she was one of these, quite a number of photojournalists active during the Second World War. Do they, do they, do they, do they, do they, do they, do they owe something directly to the Oh, well, Lee, Lee Miller is a contemporary. So Lee, Lee Miller is in Paris at the end of the 1930s and uh, as Man Ray's um, uh, assistant, uh, uh, she arrived at his studio and, and said, I'm your new assistant. He said, uh, I don't actually take assistance. And she said, she said, yeah, you do now. And he said, I do now. <laughs> so they're contemporaries and they Lee Miller would have outlived them um, and has a different kind of life story for a lot of reasons and is the only one of the three who is photographing the with the Allies in World War II. Um, you know, my choices today were somewhat arbitrary. I could have just as easily discussed Lee Miller, but you have to choose. Thank you, Danny, for the fascinating talk. I really uh, liked it. Uh, I just have, there are so many questions, of course, I'll just be very quick. But could you say something about the, the, the journey from Schwarzenbach with Ella Maillard and Claude Kenstra? I said that was, uh, I think, I didn't know about what uh, was going to And maybe give a bit more background about the story of the Mexican suitcase of Dorma. Mm -hmm. Why the connection with Apollinaire? So that's Bruce of the uh, Grand Art you are showing. Uh, could you explain that a bit again? Uh, well, the last is this re is this recording okay? That's this this one here. Is that one off? Is that off? It, I don't hear it. You might want to turn it off. No? Or do you want me to use that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's take those in the reverse order. Thank you for those uh, excellent questions, Dominique. Um, what was the last one? <laughs> Apollinaire, right? No, this is strictly between Picasso and Apollinaire, uh, who was already dead in 1941, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, he was gone already 15 years, wasn't he? Well, he died right, right. So um, it's it's uh, it was Picasso's. Uh, it was a memorial in the for um, Apollinaire, but using uh, Dora Maar as the model. The last last years of their relation. Uh, why she was buried there, I don't know. Um, she was in Paris when she died. She was um, in complete seclusion at the time. The, a, an art dealer had attempted to contact her and had, she had agreed to sell the photographs under her bed. Uh, he then sort of looked after her and finally when the guardian informed him that she was dead, he was the one who organized the funeral. Uh, which was attended, by the way, by only six people. 
And um, I don't know why she was she was uh, buried at Klamath uh, uh, Zen, uh, but she hadn't been in the in Menerb in a few years. And in Menerb, she lived in a manner that was extremely savage. I mean, when they there are pictures of her house uh, uh, after her death where you see what the way she lived, and it's really it's really shocking. But she's not a person who would have. Um, gifted herself much luxury. Um, I think that's true for all three. I mean, Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach was a person who could have easily stayed in luxurious hotels anytime she wanted, but she loved to overnight in a sleeping bag on the ground by her car, sleeping out under bridges and fields. Um, that's where she felt most at home. And that's how she slept uh, when she traveled across to Afghanistan with A. My Art. I would refer you to those two memoirs, but there are also a few books in French and German about their travels. There's very little, very little literature in English on Schwarzenbach, a bit more on Dormar and Bertotaro. But Schwarzenbach is a person who seems to have been mainly appreciated in France and in Switzerland and very belatedly. But their, their journey is um, it's documented through a, a uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of pictures, all of which are in public domain and have been digitized and available to look at in the Swiss National Library. It takes a long time to go through them all. Uh, she was she was interested in, in seeing how women lived, especially on her travels. She would write in great detail about the different customs of the women she encountered, the kinds of songs they sang, how they how they related to their babies, for example. Uh, she was also very drawn to travel to Afghanistan on the promise of drugs, and she would she would write about how they're you know they're approaching uh, Tehran or Baghdad and how there must be some great drugs in this town. I can't wait to get my hands on them. Um, she was also even though she was essentially the partner of AMI Art, and AMI Art was very much the woman on the trip, always in a skirt, and Amory uh, was always in trousers. To the whole world, they appear to be a couple. Nonetheless, on the trip to Afghanistan, Amory fell hopelessly in love with the wife of the French archaeologist in charge of the dig in Afghanistan, and when that, when those, when that love was not um, returned, Amory was in a very bad way, um, really went to pieces. And A. Maillard, at this point, finally gave up on her. Uh, Amory returned alone, and A. Maillard uh, continued to India on her own. The Mexican suitcase, well, Kappa, Dor uh, Gerda Taro died in July 1937, killed in near Madrid on the Battle of Brunete and Capa continued to photograph Spain. He got out of Spain. He got out of France just as the Nazis were about to invade. His entire photographic. By the way, uh, Gerda Taro's whole career was very existential, which is to say, she felt the need to um, uh, bear witness and to propagandize for the anti-fascist cause. Gerda Taro knew that she, that if the Nazis advanced, the fascists advanced, she would be hunted. And indeed, Gerda Taro dies in 1937. The Germans invade France and many other places. Gerda Taro's family, they're some of the first people to be exterminated by the Germans. They're all murdered, 1941. Some of the first to be murdered by gas wagons which would have been, we cannot doubt that Gerda Taro would have been killed in the Holocaust. Uh, Kappa only narrow escape, but he did, he did not manage to get out with his pictures. He sent his pictures through a back channel through the a, a Mexican consul in Bordeaux, and the pictures ended up in Mexico City, but we lost the trail of them because Kappa was killed in Indochina in 1954. The first photographer to die in the Vietnam War, when it was still the French Vietnam War. Anyway, the pictures were somehow rediscovered in 2007, and they were immediately spirited out of the country to New York. 
Um, well, why New York is one of the subjects of the documentary film about the Mexican suitcase by Trish Ziff. And um, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's, uh, these pictures have no connection at all to New York. They all end up in New York and they end up in uh, copyright in New York. So you, don't, you can't lay a glove on the uh, ICP with their, with their help. Um, in part because Kappa's family carefully safeguarded the brand, including erroneously claiming that all of Gerda Taro's pictures were Robert Kappa's. And when they finally uh, realized that this had been happening, all they had to do was peel off some paper on the back of the pictures to see if it was stamped with Photo Taro. Uh, and, um, but I think that's all of your questions. But, you know, the, 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 Kappa, the Kappa family and the Kappa brand, the Kappa's mother and Kappa's brother, Cornell, they were steadfast in, um, in maintaining the brand after, after Kappa died. You know, Kappa wasn't his real name. I can't think of any other kin, next of kin of a great artist who took on the nom de plume or the nom de guerre of the dead artist when he died. Kappa's mother and brother, who were never called Kappa, they went by Kappa after he was killed in Vietnam. <laughs> We've only got time for one more question. This is a rather theoretical question, but with regard to your definition of modernity at the start as the upsurge of technology and speed, considering your definition uh, related to Baudelaire's concept of modernity and also the well advertised fact that Baudelaire had also a sort of splenetic despair regarding that modernity, in regard to the fate of these uh, three photographers, how far would you say, if you do say so, that modernity had its own self discovery suit? Well, modernity was always a twin edged sword, wasn't it? I mean, the, the, one of the key emblems of modernity was certainly the airplane, uh, the lighter than air flight. And believe me when I tell you that as soon as the airplane flew at Kitty Hawk, they were trying to figure out ways to put guns on airplanes, uh, to shoot people down below or drop bombs on them or other objects. Uh, electricity is invented in, in uh, what was it, 1881? And just a few years later in Buffalo, the electric chair. So uh, modernity is always going to uh, uh, be a kind of um, uh, twin-edged sword, uh, and if we look at the castle of Guernica, we see this on the canvas very clearly, uh, because you know that little that little eye, which is looks like the sun on top of the picture, um, is actually a light bulb, which Picasso meant to be both light but also a, a visual poetic metaphor for for a bomb, because the word in Spanish for light bulb is the same as the word in Spanish for bomb, right, a bombilla. Um, so all these things certainly uh, go together, I, I think, in my mind. As for the origins of the term uh, and, and how far Baudelaire could have imagined our 20th century conception or my conception of modernity, I would refer you after the talk to my colleague, specialist in French literature, Dominique, uh, who probably has much to say about that, but I don't think we have time here. People, have, this was a lunchtime lecture only. <laughs> Hi, I'm just uh, just want to thank Dan for an absolutely fascinating talk. Really. It's just wonderful, and he's given us lots to think about and lots of things to follow up on, which is always really good. So thanks again for um, yeah, just a terrific lecture. Thank you very much.